I could spend all week on just this and not cover it. Okay? So, but I'm taking for granted that some of you have some background already. But I, I want to point some things out to you. And that's why I put it in your hand. You'll notice that this is, thy way is in the sanctuary. That's a, a morph of Psalm 77, 13. Actually, it says, thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. But I'm sorry, there's not a lot, not a room, a lot of room on this slide. So, um, so thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. And the truth, the, of course, Jesus is the way, right? So everything in the sanctuary is about Jesus. Mm-hmm. And so what I've done is I've given you the pictures based on the different furniture of the process going into the sanctuary that actually point to Jesus. Now, what's important is that when you look at each part of each picture, there's, there's one common denominator in each picture. And what is that common denominator? Jesus. Jesus. So every event that happens is about Jesus. Mm-hmm. Okay, now, um, please don't let me go too much too far. You'll notice... And I want to draw your attention to this. Is that at every event that you see happening in the life of Jesus, by the way, it begins with his birth, right? Every event that you see happening in that scenario, and by the way, there's seven steps in that scenario, and there's seven steps on purpose into the sanctuary. You'll notice that every step, if you look at the history that surrounded each event, was were God's people ready and understanding the event so that when it happened, they knew what was going on. No. no. So if you think that you know what's going to happen and you're ready for what's going to happen, guess what? No. Yeah. That's what makes you not ready. Because every time there was a Christ event that Jesus went through the process of for our salvation, every time he did it, that what was happening, people did not know what was happening, even though they had the manual to figure it out. Now... Something, something is change, Something's going to change. John, there's a there's a handout there in the back if you'd like one. So, this is important because the events that are about to take place. Let me go back. Each time you see that event, they could say they could they could look at the event, then look at the Bible and say, "Oh, that's what was supposed to happen. I oh, I figured it out," and they make the correction. Brad, yes? Yes. Okay. But you'll notice, when the second coming happens, are people going to stand around and say, Oh, that's what was supposed to happen. Now I figured it out. Now I can make the correction. No. No, it's too late. Too late. late. Right? So every Christ event that has happened, has happened in darkness and doubt and people not understanding. And they figure it out later. But when the second coming happens, there is no, oh, I figured it out and I figured and I, I make adjustment for later. No, no. The, when, no the, when that event happens, it's done. Probation has already closed. People are already saved or lost. And so, you know, this is, we, we talk about the delay, but part of the delay is God is not going to burst on, on this earth in a surprise and people go, oh, I didn't know anything about this. Mm-hmm. No, no, no. God wants to save everyone. And so he wants light to shine to everyone. So there's no oops, I didn't know. No, that's not what's going to happen to second coming. And there's no figuring it out later. So this is why it's important that God has a messenger on this earth who understands the advent of the Creator that is not only understanding and preparing themselves for the revelation of Jesus Christ, but they are also giving a message to the rest of the world about something that's happening. Right. The problem is, is that what we tell people is going to happen most of the time doesn't have Jesus at the center. Again, let me remind you of the picture that I put in your hand. Every time the event happened, who was the center of the event? Jesus. Jesus. So the events that are happening in your world, the things that we expect to happen in the world, we, we have all this list that the Adventists have of these events that are going to happen. Is, is, are, is Jesus in the center? Are those events about Him? Then, see, there's the problem. You know, we're, we're talking about the Holy Spirit, and I don't want to... I'm doing morning worship. Please come. I'm not doing that, but I'm in charge, and I'll be doing the one on Friday, but it's about the, the Holy Spirit is the theme. 
Jesus said the Holy Spirit will take from what is mine and make it known unto you. The Holy Spirit is going to make you come to, help to come to know Jesus. That's right. Mm-hmm. He's not going to empower you for anything else. Yes. He doesn't talk about so, himself. So Jesus needs to be the center. And so even though I'm going to pass this slide, we can spend all week here, it's important to me that what I'm talking to you about is Jesus. Now, Jesus is a real person. Amen. Yeah. That means he was God, but he became he became a man. The little baby there is Jesus. He became a man, which means that he limited himself, limited himself to the same things that limits that we have. Time and space. Jesus is a real person in a real place in real time. Amen. And he is coming back. Amen. Now, if Jesus is the most important thing to you, then you need to know, you, you should want to know, where is Jesus? What is he doing? That's what's most important. Yes. And the events that are going to happen on this earth are a consequence or a result of what he is doing. Yep. So it's about him. And so when we tell the world, we don't tell the world, oh, the, the papacy, the market, the, you know, no, those are all effects of something that's happening in heaven. Our message is about Jesus. Jesus is doing something. Something's happening to him. Notice each of these events up there, something happened to Jesus. And so what I want to talk to you about is Jesus. And what does the sanctuary tell us about what Jesus, who Jesus is, what he's doing, what's to happen next? Many people think they're waiting, sitting around waiting for Jesus to come. No. You see on your sheet, it's not on there. You see on the sheet, I have a picture of Jesus' second coming, yes? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You notice where it is. Where is it? In the cloud. Upper right hand corner. Upper right hand corner. Why is it the upper right hand corner? It's in the courtyard. Because just as the first advent takes place there, that's where the second advent takes place. Which means, if Jesus is in the most holy place now, and the second advent happens out there, then what has to happen before he comes? Well, there's a series of of events that happen to Jesus. He's a real person in a real place, and there's a process of him coming back. And when we see him in the clouds, that's the end result. But there's a process of his return. We call that process last day events. But, but sadly enough, most of the time we talk about last day events, we end up talking about all the stuff going on out here, and we don't know what's going, where he is and what's going on up there. <laughs> Which is why our message has no power. Because the power comes from Jesus. Jesus. And the Holy Spirit said that God, Jesus said he would take from what is mine and make it known unto uh, you. So this study is about Jesus. And I want you to notice the next thing. And I know I'm going to take too much time, but you'll notice that every time Jesus did something, that was present truth for that time. So present truth is always about Jesus. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So if it's present truth, then it's the present about what Jesus is, who he is, and what he's doing. So if I ask you present truth and you say Jesus died on the cross, no, no, that was present truth. It's still truth, but it's not present truth. So any of these seven events that we talk about, by the way, we're experts about Jesus going into the sanctuary. We're just, we're just novices about him coming out, which is so strange because our name, Advent, means what? We're supposed to be experts about him coming out. So we're experts about him coming in, but we're ignorant about him coming out. And if we're the messengers that are supposed to share with the world about him coming out, and we're ignorant of that, then is the world does the world understand him now? So the idea is that each step of the, each step of Christ's ministry was present truth while it was happening. And so what we need to understand, and I, there's a million quotes I could give you from the Bible as well as your prophecy, that present truth is what we're supposed to focus on now. But present truth is supposed to be questions you're asking: Where is Jesus? What is he doing? What's he doing next? What does that mean? What does the Bible tell me about that? By the way, does the Bible tell you about that? Yes, yes it does. And that's what we're going to spend our time this week talking about. <coughs> so, present truth. Let's see here. Is it not working? Okay. 
technology. The presence of the one who is true. Yeah. All right, I'll do this this way. So, Jesus, the last thing we know absolutely for sure that we know is that Jesus went from the holy place to the most holy place in 1844. That's the last Christ event that we know absolutely for sure, yes? Yes. Okay, when Jesus went into the sanctuary, Jesus went from the holy place to the most holy place, there was many truths that came to light because of that movement, that motion, that, that step, yes? So, we, we have to talk about the five S's. You know, we had the state of the dead and the second coming and the sanctuary and the spirit of prophecy. And then what was the last one? Spirits. No. What's that? Sanctuary, state of the dead, the Sabbath, the spirit of prophecy, and then the second coming. Those are the five pillars of Adventism. And you'll notice this, the Christ, Christ's second coming is one of those five. Now, my, my question and my point to you here is, Jesus entered the most holy place in 1844 as our high priest. He's coming as our king. king. He's coming as our king. So, if Jesus is high priest now, and he comes as king, then does it make sense that before he comes as king, he must become king? So, is that going to be one of those events that are on your your paper that they're, they're not filled in yet? Yes? Mm-hmm. So, the idea is that he must come from being, high, from, from being high priest ministering before the throne. He's actually going to be set upon the throne. When Jesus comes, he comes on the clouds. What are the clouds? Angels. They're the throne. Yeah. Right. Angels, but they're clouds. His God's throne is a living throne. If you read Ezekiel, right? He doesn't deal with dead things. He has living things. Right? <laughs> So he has a living throne, just like he has a living city, like he wants to live in you and me to be living temples, right? So he's coming on the clouds, he's coming as king on the throne. So before he comes as king, again, he must become king. He, th- that means that he transitions from ministering before the throne to being upon the throne. Do you think that that event is going to cause any disturbances in our universe? Yes. Sure. Yes. I mean... What, what was the issue between between Lucifer and God in the beginning? What was the what was the issue? Someone wanted to sit somewhere and there you don't belong there. Right? And then because man fell, someone else who was on the throne stepped down from the throne to save lost humanity. Who was that? Jesus. So Jesus stepped down from the throne of the universe. Down, 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 down to save us. And then since his resurrection, he's been going up, 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 up. To to what's the final step? When he's restored back to the throne of the universe as God, that's the full completion of the process. That's the perfection of our salvation. That perfection of our salvation is in him. We have a lot of theological discussions about perfection and how do we... how is God's character perfected in us? No, his, God's character is perfected in him. And we abide in him and he abides in us. So we partake Amen. of his perfection. Yeah. It's his righteousness. Amen. It's his faith. It's his goodness. It's, it, it's all about him. Yes. Worthy is the so Lamb. So the perfection of God's people, the fulfilling of the character of God and his people, happens when he comes to the completion of his process. And by the way, has the process been completed yet? No. 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 So, he says it is finished, by the way, three times. So, so much to say. Are you interested in this topic? Yes. All right. So, he's going to go from the right hand of the throne. By the right hand of the throne, throughout Scripture, is always the priestly position. The book of Hebrews, by the way, Paul is teaching present truths in Hebrews. He says 12 or 13 times Jesus is at the right hand of the throne. Right hand of the throne. And he also says that Jesus is the high priest. Never once in the book of Hebrews does Paul describe Jesus as king because that's not present truth. He's dealing with present truth. The right hand of the throne is not on the throne. The right hand of the throne is a priestly position. Okay? Again. So that's why I have this picture. You're going to see it this week. The transition from him being ministering before the throne to being upon the throne is, is, is something that we need to catch the reality of. So 
Here's my first question that we're going to deal with this week, and I'm going to, I'm going to show you from the Bible these, these, these points. And this is the, the main thing that I'm going to share with you, and then there's another thesis I'll, I'll share with you later. It says, does the Bible pro- prophesy of the event when the high priest ministering in the most holy place on the Day of Atonement, are we being specific about what we're looking for? The high priest ministering in the most holy place on the Day of Atonement is, is placed on the throne and given a crown and, and, and made king. Does the Bible prophesy such event? Yes. No. Okay, so let's go to the Bible and see. Consider the prophecies of Zechariah. And I have given you a handout with them. And I put, I put it on the slide for us to see. Zechariah chapter 6. Now, I'm going to go to Zechariah chapter 3, but I gave you all of chapter 6. And you'll notice I can put 9 through 15 on there because it's a whole section. It's a whole thought. It's not, you're not dealing with part of the text. So we're not cherry picking text out of context. And I will, I'd love to spend the whole week talking to you about Zechariah. You know, where it can't be. It's a piece of tabernacles. That's what we're here for. That's what the whole book of Zechariah is all about. Amen. Anyway. So, we'll read the text, and we'll, then, we'll, then we'll dig into it. It says, Thus the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Take of them of the captivity of Heldei, Tobijah, Jedediah, which are come from Babylon, and come thou the same day, and go into the house of Josiah, the son of Zephaniah. Then take silver and gold, and make crowns. And set them upon the head of Joshua, Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. High priest. <laughs> and speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold, the man whose name is branch. the branch. Notice the word branch is all in capital. capital letters. That's significant. He shall grow up out of his place. He shall build the temple of the Lord. Who builds the temple of the Lord, by the way? Jesus. The son of David builds the temple. Yes, that's why Solomon built the temple. But of course, Solomon is a type of Jesus Christ. So, he shall build the temple of the Lord. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord. Maybe God wants us to catch that. And he's going to say it three times. <laughs> right? <clears throat> and he shall bear the glory. And he shall sit and rule... On the right hand of the throne. Yeah. No. no, that's not what it said. Upon. Where is he sitting and rule? Upon. Upon the throne. Says his throne. Yes. So now he's not the high priest ministry before the throne. Now he's actually be given, be given crown. He's already in this high priest guard. Now he's given crowns and he's sat on the throne and it's his throne. And it says he shall rule upon his throne. He shall be a priest upon his throne. And the council of peace shall be between them both. And the crown shall be to Helen, to Bijah, and Jediah, the he- and to Ham, the son of Zephaniah, for memorial of the temple of the Lord. Notice, and I spent time here, when Jesus is crowned king, what happens to those who are his servants? They receive crowns. They are also crowned. Oh! So something when something happens to him, something happens to those who are in his body. <coughs> So he receives power and rule and authority in heaven. And when that happens, what happens to those who are his on on this earth? Oh, amazing. I thought thought we had to work hard and make this happen and and pray for the latter rain so we can go out and change and save the world. Is that what we're supposed to be doing? No. No, we're supposed to be abiding in him, hiding in him, being in him. So whatever happens to him comes to, to us. We are his body. And then the things that we are to do will be, we will do it because we're empowered by Him to do it. Yes? And then the what will be our message to the world? Come join our church? No! Worship the King. The King is coming. The King is coming. Right? When Jesus comes, how many groups of people are there? There's two. The saved and the lost. Right? So, so anyway, I don't want to... So you see, does, so the question is, does the Bible tell us of an event where the high priest ministering in the most holy place is 
taken, given a crown, set up on the throne, and made king. Does the Bible prophesy yes. such yes. an event? Yes. By the way, the name Joshua is the Old Testament name for Jesus. Jesus. Wow. So the prophecy just doesn't randomly say a high priest. It says specifically what the high priest's name is. His name is Joshua. Jesus. Okay. So Joshua the high priest becomes king. king. Now, I want to understand the context of this so that we're going to, well, I want to dig into the text to prove to you that this is the Day of Atonement and that this is the high priest becoming king. And that we want to see it from the context. Right? So, where in the sanctuary is the throne? <clears throat> it's in the most holy place. So we know it's in the most holy place. But I don't, I don't want to just take that logic and rest on that. We want to see it from the text. But we know that the most holy place is where the throne of God is. That's getting all confusing to me because sometimes it talks on, on the side of the north. Yes. Yes. But see, the sanctuary... The sanctuary that we see east, north, south, east, west, that's flat like this, is actually a mountain. It's Mount Sinai. And the sanctuary that we, I wish I had a picture. If you take your, if you take your picture of this, like this, if you take your sanctuary and you flip it like this, you realize that when they went to Sinai, remember they put a, a, they put a barrier around Sinai. Yes, and then when they offered the burnt offerings, that was down at the bottom of the mountain. And there was a, a water that, that flowed from the rock, and there was a river that came from Sinai. And then when, they, when, when, when you went up the mountain, when you went up the mountain, where's the burning bush? It's on Mount Sinai, it's Mount Horeb. So, by the way, there's your burning bush right there, it's the menorah. And when, remember, he took the elders up in Exodus 24, and they sat and ate in the presence of God. Where were they? Well, they were right here at the table of the bread of the presence. They sat, ate, and drank in the presence of God. And then this is the altar of incense. And then when Moses wanted to get the Ten Commandments, where did he go? He went up to the top of the mount. Why the top of the mount? Because that's the, that's the upper side. That's the size of the north. The, the, the throne that Lucifer wanted to sit in in Isaiah 14 is in the upper side of the north. Where is that? That's heaven. North is that way. Right? So the most holy place is where God's throne is. That's the sides of the north. Okay? Very good. Very good question. Thank you. So. Isn't that what Satan wanted? That's where he wanted to sit. Yeah. Okay. That's right. And by the way, when we play God, that's where we say we want to sit. <laughs> Which is the scariest thing in the world. We can't even run our own life. We think we want to run the universe. <laughs> okay, so the question here is, what is the branch symbolism in the Bible? What does the branch symbolism mean? All right? And so I have two texts that we're going to use. Uh, I could do, We could use more, but I'm going to use two texts, and then we're going to go back to Zechariah. So Jeremiah 23, 5, and 6. I didn't give these to you in handout. I didn't give you every text I'm going to quote. I, that would be impossible. But if you go to Jeremiah 23, 5, and 6, here's what it says. It says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch. branch and a, and what shall I have? what's the righteous branch? What's it say? King. A king shall reign, reign and, prosper. and prosper and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. By the way, it's the king who does the judging. The king always does the judging. It's not a high priestly function. It's a kingly function. So he's already the king. No, not yet. Judgment's been going for... Yes, but the judgment of what? Yeah. Yeah. And by the way, we're going to get to that. Because what happens for the judgment to transfer from the dead to the living? Living. living what must happen? Something has to happen to Jesus. Because who judges the living? Who determines who comes into the kingdom or not? The king. He determines who's, who's welcome into the kingdom and who's not welcome into the kingdom. He's the judge. Right? Thank you very much for your comment. Thank you. All right. So it says, verse 6, In his days Judah shall be saved. By the way, salvation is a kingly function. I can give you many texts in the Bible. Isaiah uh, 33, 22 is a great text. The Lord is our king. The Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. He shall save us. Salvation is a kingly function. It's the king who saves. 
So it says, He shall execute judgment and justice new. In his days, Jews shall be saved. Israel shall dwell safely. And then, and this is his name where he shall be called. Notice, the name is all in caps again. The Lord, whose righteousness? Our righteousness. Our righteousness. We are saved by His righteousness. Amen. But His righteousness has to become our righteousness. Yes? The see says our righteousness. Second, Second another, Corinthians 5. Another week's study <laughs> in Jeremiah. Okay, so you'll notice that the branch is a king shall reign. Now I'm going to go to Isaiah 11. What to guess? And, and what, what's the, the significance of the all capital letters? In all capital letters, you'll notice in your Bible, the, the there's a name in the Bible that's always in all caps. What is that name? Lord. It's the Lord. It's actually Yahweh. It's the name of God. So when you have the name of God, it's always in caps. Yes, the divine name is always in caps. Now there is another name that's not God that's in caps. Do you know where that one is? Harlot or the beast. Yeah, in Revelation 17, there's a harlot, and she has a name on her forehead. It's all in caps. Why is it all in caps? Because she's claiming to be... She's claiming to be God. So if you look at, for example, in the Gospels, when it says they shall call his name Jesus, you'll notice the name is all in caps. Why is it all in caps? Because he's God. So the branch here, again, the... When the rotors, people wrote the Bible, there, there's certain words, names of God they put in all caps because they're showing reverence to the creator of, of the universe. Mm -hmm. Who happens to be? Jesus. Thank you. <laughs> so here's Isaiah 11. He says, There shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge, and the fear of the Lord. This, and if we could go into Isaiah 11, which is a beautiful chapter that it's, it's not about heaven. It's about him becoming king. Mm. This is what it talks about the lion, the lamb, and the leopard with the kid, right? Right? What happens to the nature of the beast? It's transformed. And when is the nature of the beast transformed? Oh, when I go to heaven? No. No, no. When he becomes king, those who are his receive the benefits of his kingship and their nature is transformed. You will no longer be a beast. You will be in the likeness and the image of God. You know, the kingdom of God is within. Yes. So, by the way, this, you're going to hear about sevens a lot. You'll notice in this text that the Spirit of the Lord is described seven different times. So, when Christ becomes king, I don't know if you know anything about the book of Revelation, but seven has a lot to do with the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is about the revelation of the king. That's why it's always talking about sevens. So, you'll notice throughout Scripture, you're going to see it today, you're going to see it tomorrow, you're going to see it all week, that when it talks about the king, it's always in the context of seven, because seven is the number of... Perfection. Perfection, completion, fullness. That's why there were seven steps in the process of him going into the sanctuary. Guess how many steps there is in the process of him coming out? Probably seven. Oh, lucky guess. Isn't that, doesn't that make sense? Yes, there's seven. So that's why I'm saying there's a process of Jesus coming back. By the way, there's a group of people in the Revelation talks about they follow the Lamb. Where's he going? In the sanctuary. Yes. They're following the process of him coming out. They know what's going on, and they're actually telling other people what's going on. By the way, there's somebody else who knows the process. Same yeah. thing. And in Daniel 11, it talks about he hears these tidings from the east, and he reacts. So he knows when Christ becomes king, and begins the process of coming out, and that's when destruction and chaos is going to hit this world like we've never seen. Yeah, the living. So, the, the point here is that, and I won't, I'm giving you two witnesses, but the branch, the symbolism of the branch is always that there's a new king. Right. So when Joshua the high priest is called the branch, and he's given crowns to set upon the throne to rule, then is that message clear that he's now king? Yes. Is, that, yes. is there yes. any, any, any doubt with it? Yes. Okay. Seven is the number of completions I already mentioned. Um, we didn't get to Zechariah 3 yet, but 
it, Revelation talks about the seven spirits of God before the throne. Uh, it also talks about the seven eyes. Well, these Isaiah 11 talks about the seven spirits of God, and Zechariah 3 talks about the seven eyes, and together they're both talking about the kingship that Revelation 5 puts together, that this is talking about the king. So, the branch symbolism, the branch symbolism is not new to Zechariah in chapter 6. It's also in Zechariah chapter 3. Again, I apologize, I don't have chapter 3 typed out for you, but um, we can spend all week studying Zechariah 3 as well. Uh, so if you want to turn in your Bibles, if you have your Bibles to Zechariah 3, I will read to you. I have Zechariah 3, 8 here on the, on the screen, but I'm more than happy to answer any questions you have about Zechariah. Um, what, I want to, what I want to show you on the screen here is that, again, in Zechariah chapter 3, here now will Joshua, and what's his position? He's the high priest. Thou and thy fellows, again, that sit before thee, so the high priest and those fellows who sit before him, they are meant to be wondered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant, the... So Joshua, who is the high priest, it becomes the branch, who is the... King. King. And in Zechariah chapter 3, it says that he will... He says, Thus says the Lord, if thou wilt walk in my ways and will keep my charge, then shalt thou judge my house and shall also keep my courts. You know, now, those two, those two descriptions of, of Joshua, one is high priestly and one is kingly. As I showed you in Zechariah 6, the priest becomes king. Now he's the king priest on his throne. He doesn't stop being doing one function when he goes to the next function. Just the same as when he went to the most holy place, that doesn't deny the cross. Just because it's present truth doesn't deny the past truth. You know, it builds on the, pre- the past truth to become present truth. So all the gifts of Christ become mature fullness in him. The seven is fullness, yes? So all the works that he has done com- continue to, to grow and compile so that when he becomes king, it's the fullness of all of it. Right? Yeah. So Zechariah 3 also describes the symbolism of Joshua the high priest becoming king. Is that clear? Yes. We can study Zechariah if you'd like. So again, Joshua the high priest becomes the branch, becomes king. So the question comes now. Yes, we see Joshua the high priest. Yes, he becomes king. But the question is, is Zechariah in the context of the Day of Atonement? Now again, we can say, well, it must be because... If Joshua's in the high, Joshua the high priest is in the most holy place, what's the only time, the only day of the year day that the high priest is in the most holy place? The day of the day of the day. It has to be the day of atonement. But again, I don't want to I don't want to settle on just logic, our human logic. Our human logic is faulty, right? So we want to see from the text, we want to prove from the text of Zechariah that this is a day of atonement event. Alright. So we're going to go to Zechariah chapter 3. The first witness, since Je- Zechariah chapter 3 is also where the branch Joshua becomes king. We're going to notice Zechariah chapter 3 verses 1 through 4. And it says, He showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the Lord. The angel of the Lord and Satan standing his right hand to resist him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, O Satan. Even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked out of the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments, and he stood before the angels. And he answered and spoke unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him, un, and unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thy iniquity to pass from thee. I will clothe thee with a change of raiment. So, the high priest here is now given a change of, gar- change of his garments. So where in the scripture does the high priest change his garments? Before he comes out, right? Yeah, so Leviticus 16, by the way, is a chapter in the Bible that describes the liturgy of the Day of Atonement. And if you go to Leviticus 16... Because that was a special day. Yes. By the way, notice he's, his garments are filthy garments, and he changed to his clean garments. How did his garments get filthy? Sin. Whose sin? Mine. 
His garments are filthy because of my sin. He bears my sin in himself so I can be I can be clean. He bears my death in himself so I can have life. That's what the high priest is doing. Yes. So his garments are filthy because he's wearing your sin. He's becoming sin in the sight of God for you. So you can become the righteousness of God in him. Yes. So notice the text. Aaron shall come into the tabernacle of the Lord. He shall put off the linen garments. He shall wash his flesh with water and put on the garments and come forth. The high priest changes his garments on the day of atonement. There's only two other times that he changes his garments. One is when he, du- when he takes the ashes out of the altar of burnt offering and he goes and dumps the ashes and he, then he's to, to wash and change his garments. That's, by the way, is going to happen at the end when we talk about Revelation chapter 20 and the lake of fire and all that. Okay, that's not the day of atonement. Actually, it's the end of the day of atonement. But the point is, the changing of the garments in scripture is a day of atonement event. Okay? So that's the first witness in Zechariah. The second witness is in the same text that we just read. In Zechariah chapter 3, 9, it says, He's going to remove the iniquity of the land in a single day. What's the one day of the year where all the iniquity was removed from God's people, removed from the camp? Day of atonement. The day of atonement. So Zechariah chapter 3 tells us that Joshua, the high priest, is going to become king. And it's going to happen during the day of atonement ministration. While the high priest is in the most holy place. He's going to be taken from the ministry before the throne. And he's going to be set upon the throne. He's going to become king. Is that clear? So is that 1844 then? What's that? Does that mean 1844? No. That means that the... During the Day of Atonement liturgy, right. So some point after, and we'll get to that, the day 1844 is when he went into the most holy place. Right. It began, as the sister had shared, the administration. But not king. No. No, not yet. By the way, if he was king, you would know it. You wouldn't be sitting comfortably here at camp meeting if he's king. Because yeah. someone would be after you. Because yeah. yeah. you're supposed to be the messenger. And we got it easy right now, but we don't. When this happens, you're not. You'll you'll know. By the way, we're starting to hear the rumblings, aren't we? Yes. You're starting to see the world fall apart, aren't we? Yes. Yeah. But when this event happens, guess what? No holes barred. Yeah. No, no, no. Satan's going to take control of this world, and he's going to do things that's going to shock everyone. You know, and I mentioned Daniel 11. And I don't want, I'm, by the way, I'm doing a study in Daniel 11 at one o'clock. They're going to announce it. Um, but he says in Daniel 11 that the king of the earth, he hears tidings from the east and the north. The east and the north. What are those tidings? Jesus is coming. Jesus is becoming king. And it says, it says in Daniel 11, where he hears tidings from the east and the north, and he, it alarms him. So he turns to annihilate many. When Satan here, when the king of the north hears that Christ has become king in heaven, he's going to kill as many people on this planet as fast as he can. Why? Because the judgment of the living is come and he does not want them to, to choose life. So he's going to kill as many people as quickly as he can. That's what Daniel 11.44 tells you. And by the way, when Satan, when Satan is, is, is on his hell-bent to kill as many people on this planet as fast as he can, guess what? You're not going to sit comfortably. Who's he coming after first? Mm. He's coming after God's people that have this message that it will give light to other people. He doesn't want that light to shine. So he's going to try to stop the light before it shines. And he can't stop Jesus from becoming king in heaven. So who's he coming after? Sure. Who's he coming after, John? John the Baptist? Who's he coming after? Yeah. In the dark. So this is all preparatory to Daniel 12, 1, where the close of probation ends. This is all before this. Then. Well, yeah, we'll, 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 we, need to, we need to expand our thinking on some things, yes. But yes, we'll, we'll, we'll go there. So the idea of removing the iniquity in one day, the point here is that Zechariah tells us that the high priest Joshua, whose name is Jesus, is placed, placed on the throne and becomes king. And it's, it's a day of atonement event. It happens in the most holy place on the day of atonement. It's part of the day of atonement liturgy, actually. And if we had a chance to study Leviticus 16, I could show you that as well. 
So, the point here is that Zechariah's prophecies of Joshua the high priest being crowned and seated upon the throne as king is a day of atonement event. That's my point to you. Is that clear? Yes. Okay. The next point that I'm going to... So the, this is the question. Does the Bible present an event when the high priest... Yes. The answer is yes. Yes? Yes. yes. Yeah. By the way, I'm going to show you this week, not just... I'm going to show you in Daniel, I'm going to show you in Revelation, I'm going to show you many different places in the Bible. This event, this event is the event that most of the Bible is pointing towards. Actually, there's... Jesus has three comings, right? There's three times he comes. Mm-hmm. There's three times he says, it is done. By the way, all of the, all his comings, all three comings, by the way, are in Zechariah. All, the, the Bible always points towards the coming of the Messiah. And by the way, it, the, the one, just because it talks about one coming, that, that description of that coming also describes the other comings because in principle it's the same thing. Does that make sense? Yes. So most, of, 90 some percent of the Bible is dealing with this event. By the way, when you get to heaven for a thousand years, there's another coming. And there's going to be another, it is done. And you're going to spend that thousand years studying it out again, because the process is going to happen over. But of course, it'll be much nicer studying it in heaven, won't it? <laughs> You'll actually have a brain that'll understand it, right? And you won't have the flesh to fight with while you're doing it. But the point is, you're going to have work to do. Because judgment doesn't end when Jesus comes. There's another judgment. But anyway, that's more of the story. The process takes place again. Okay. That's right. Well, who's judged then? After probation? Yes. The remaining that are done. Paul says that you're going to judge angels. Yes. That's what I'm saying. That's exactly what I'm saying. Thank you. That's right. And all the wicked that are not in heaven, guess what? You're going to judge. By the way, you're going to have some questions, aren't you, about who's there and who's not there? Yeah, God's going to make things plain. So there's, this process is going to happen again. So, the Spirit of Prophecy comments on, on chap, uh, Zechariah chapter 3. By the way, you'll notice, and I, I need to apologize later for this, but what you'll notice that I show you from the Bible, and then we go to the Spirit of Prophecy. Amen. See, that's how you study you study from the Bible, and then you go to the spirit, spirit of prophecy. That's how you're supposed to do it. So if someone asks you a question, like he mentioned, well, no, so then if he asks a question, oh, let's study this, everybody runs home and sees what Mrs. White says about that, mm-hmm. and then they say they study. No, that's, I'm sorry, mm-hmm. no, that's wrong. No. And you don't understand what Mrs. White is saying if you don't know what the Bible is saying. You're going to twist what she says to make it her say what you think she says. <laughs> you need to study the Bible, and what you when you study the Bible, then you can understand what Mrs. White is really saying. And many of what, many things that she says are deep and profound. They're not simple on the surface. So that, that's a tool. You, we need to be careful. So now I'm going to the Spirit of Prophecy. And notice what she says, her comments on Zechariah chapter 3. And I gave you the... the, the there's two of them, and you, I gave you the sources so you can look them up. She describes Zechariah chapter 3. Zechariah chapter 3, what happens in Zechariah chapter 3? Joshua, Jesus, the high priest, becomes king. King. the branch, the king. And this happens during the Day of Atonement. That's what she's commenting on. Notice, Jesus is our great high priest in heaven, and what is he doing? He is making intercession and atonement for those who believe in him. So she's, she's saying Zechariah 3 is Zechariah three is about the Day of Atonement. Yes? Can you tell me what T is? Testimonies to ministers. Okay, sir. No, it's no such thing. <laughs> Will this correspond in, in any way with the Day of Atonement as, you know, what is it, in September, or whatever, the Jewish Day of Atonement? Will it correspond with that time, or is this symbolic? Well, actually, the, the good question. The day of, see, the Day of Atonement isn't like any of the other feasts. The Day of Atonement is a Sabbath. So you'll notice there's this, there's a Sabbath of every week. Then there's a month, Sabbath of month, the seventh month. Then there's a Sabbath of years. Then there's a Sabbath of year of years. So the Day of Atonement is a Sabbath, and it has many different levels to it, which is one of the reasons why we think we know about it, but we don't understand it, because we see it as one day. So the Day of Atonement actually spans the whole process of salvation. So Sabbath is special 
in God's eyes. I don't know if you're familiar with I'm that. I'm new with this. Yeah. Very, very good question. And there's no such thing as a dumb question. Very good. And if I go too far too fast, ca- capture me afterwards. I'll explain anything you want to know. I, I, I'm not trying to, to go over anybody. All right? So yes, the Day of Atonement is a Sabbath. And yes, the, 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 week, the, the Day of Atonement and the yearly cycle is a symbol of this process. But the process is so much larger. Just like we say, Day of Atonement began in 1844, right? Uh, well, if it's only one day, then, then it wasn't one day, that day. Well, a day's a year, so it's a whole year, so it goes to 1845. Are we still in the Day of Atonement? Are we still in the Day of Atonement? Yes. yes so is it a day? No. So it, again, it's it's not, right. My Jewish friend that lives up in Moon Lake, not too far from where you live, said this was a special day to make sure they are right with God. That's, right. that's the best he could understand it. Yeah. Right. Pastor Tim, just quick, I mean, kind of in relation to what you're saying, I mean, the, the, the anti-typical Day of Atonement did begin on the literal Day of Atonement. And they yeah, go right, that's right. that light in, in the summer of 1844 called the Midnight Cry, which was called the Seventh Month Movement. And that's how they came to October 22. Yes. So the significant it was a events, Day of Atonement for that year. The significant yes. events of the closing of the Day of Atonement should also be connected with the literal Day of Atonement. So, so the point is that God always connects things together. Yes. Yeah, you'll see the cycle. Okay, so the point here is that the Spirit... Yes. Yeah, quick question, and I've got to back up on it. It is finished three times. Now, of course, on the cross, and then uh, when probation is closed, where's the other it is finished? Well, if you keep your in the pro, your Revelation 16, when you deal with the second one, if you go to the end of Revelation, when it talks about the third coming of Christ, he says again, it is done. So each time, he, he says that it's finished three times, and each time deals with his coming. The first time he says it is the first coming. The second time he says it's connected to his second coming. The third time he says it is when, with his third coming. And each time he says it, he says it as king. It's the, he's the king. Because he's the only one that can say, it is done. He's the only one that can say, it is finished. He's the only one that can say, you're welcome into my kingdom. He's also the only one that can say, you're not welcome into my kingdom. You and I have no say about whether somebody else is in or not in God's kingdom. Do we? No. Luckily, praise God, the king is the only one who determines when who's in his kingdom and who's not in his kingdom. Praise God for that. Yes. Thank you. So you, and then Jesus died down to the top with the scriptures of sin. That's the end of the day to a day like that's all time. So Jesus gave you a two sort of sins, one that one that you got, and the second one, he took you out. In the second book, so it's what Jesus gave you out, what Jesus gave you out. That day, two things is a great day of the, when it's a boy's work, Jesus is the most work with the head section. And it's a boy's work with the green, Break the plan of jail, that's open. And then, and the difficulty of the so Thank you so much for sharing. And then, Thank you, that. And when, when Jesus, when, when Jesus went to most holy places to head to the sanctuary, our foundation is closed. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Well, well, well we, we, we need to talk about, yes. Thank you for sharing. We need to talk about it. Evans, we have this close of probation fetish. We need to, we really need to re examine some things. Um, we tend to think once our skin is in, probation's closed, we're going home. I'm sorry, God is interested in saving much more than just us. Yes. And so Amen. our probation closes our long probation before other people's probation closes. Yes. So when we talk about the close of probation, it's a process. By the way, how many steps of Jesus coming out of the sanctuary? Seven. So that's a process. And the close of probation is also a process. So we like to think in our Greek thinking of one event that happens in one time, one space, and it's all done. No, that's not how it works. Sorry. Well, actually, I'm not sorry. But that, so there's some things in our thinking that need to be adjusted. We tend to think of the close of probation as a one-time event that happens in one, and then it's all done. So why are we supposed to keep an ear open for when the National Sunday Law... 
picked in. That's no. kind of sudden. That's still a process. Yes, but see, the thing is, the National Sunday Law is a process. It's actually a process now happening, right? Mm-hmm. But the point is, what I'm trying to tell you is that you're supposed to be keeping your ear and your mind open to know what Jesus is doing. And once you know what Jesus is doing, then you know it's going to happen down here. Right. So our focus is up there. That's the process. And by the way, the process is down here will take place, but the process of, of what's going on up there is what's important. Yes. So yes. And they are connected, by the way. Well, there's times that I think we know a whole lot more that's going on in earth politics than we do politics in heaven. <laughs> and that's the problem. <laughs> that's the problem. And by the way, in my game of study, I don't want to go up to this, but the, the king of the north and the king of the south, we're not supposed to be in either of those camps. That's right. You're not supposed to be involved in the mess of this world. No, we're supposed to be calling people out of the world to Christ. So all the worldly labels don't don't count. They don't work. And actually, when we get absorbed in the worldly labels, whether it's light, dark, tall, short, left, right, whatever you want to call it, then you're not talking about Jesus. And therefore, you have no light to give to people. You're only going to connect with people that, that are like you. Okay, so one sinner connects to a like sinner, and we say, oh, we're okay because we sin the same. Well, that's great. That has nothing to do with the gospel or what God wants to do on this earth. He's trying to save us out of this mess. Amen. So, yeah, that, that's part of the distraction, isn't it? Mm-hmm. So, let me finish this. This is important because I want to get to the next step. I only have a few minutes. I want to... All right. So, this, this quote is... An amazing quote, and we're going to look at it. But notice she says, Zechariah's vision of Joshua and the angel by the five of the testimonies. By the way, she has a whole chapter. It's like uh, it's like 10 or 15 pages she writes on this. This is a beautiful chapter. So she deals with it personally, she deals with it corporately, and she deals with a big picture in terms of what she's addressing here. Beautiful, beautiful chapter. This is on Zechariah chapter, uh, chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. She says, Zechariah's vision of Joshua and the angel applies with peculiar force to the experience of God's people in the closing up of the great day of atonement. Notice that she doesn't say the day of atonement. She says the the closing up. What is the closing up of the great day of atonement? Finishing up. Yeah. So so she says that when Jesus, who is high priest, becomes king, in the most holy place during the day of atonement that that event is connected to uh, the, the closing up of the great day of atonement and it applies to God's people with peculiar force what's peculiar mean? something special something different something that's not normal yeah so Zechariah's prophecies of Joshua the high priest being crowned and seated upon the throne as king is a day of atonement event. The event transpires in the most holy place, which means that this event can only occur after 1844, and it must occur before Jesus comes. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. All right. Now, I'm going to give you a little Adventist graph since we're good Adventists about our timelines. And I'm only going to put on the things that we know absolutely for sure. 1844, Jesus went into the most holy place. Amen. Yes? Yeah. Okay. The word present means that we're alive here after 1844. Is that true? Yes. Yeah. Okay. We're in year 2022. Now, we know that Jesus is coming. That's at the end. Yes? We know that before Jesus comes, there's a close of probation. Yes. Right? Now, we don't know when that is, but we know these events are going to happen. Mm-hmm. Now, notice the judgment of the dead, as Sister Sheridan began in 1844. At some point, before probation can close, the judgment was passed from the dead to the living. Living. So that this event, the passing of the judgment of the dead to the judgment of the living, must occur before probation can close. Otherwise, people can't choose to be saved. Okay? So... I'm, what I'm telling you is that when he becomes king, he must become king before he can come as king. When he becomes king, that's the event that begins the judgment of the living. That's the event that begins all the chaos this world is going to see. Because that's the event, that's the issue of strife between Lucifer and his creator about who is who's the king. That's what I'm submitting to you. So... 
This is the second thesis that we're going to study this week, and I'm going to do it each week, each day. Does this event, Jesus becoming king, begin the judgment of the living? That's the question. I would say yes. Well, I'm, I'm going to, I want to give us more support than just our version. I'm going to be, this week, I'm going to show you from the Bible that that answer is yes. The same as the answer to the first question is yes. But because I only have a few minutes left, I'm going to tag along, and this is my apology. Remember, I'm supposed to show you from the Bible first, then show you from the Spirit of Prophecy. Well, I'm already in the Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 5 of the Testimonies, with a, with a quote that I gave you about the closing up of God's work. So what I want to do today... And you can apologize, I apologize ahead of time. And tomorrow I'll show you from the Bible, and Wednesday I'll show you from the Bible, Thursday I'll show you from the Bible, Friday, you, and if you want to talk to me, I'll show you from the Bible all week, I don't care. I love showing you people this from the Bible. Because the, all the things that Christ is doing for our salvation are in His plan book right here. God says, I do nothing without first revealing myself to my servants, the prophets. The whole plan of salvation is in this book. The whole plan of salvation is in the sanctuary. Thy way is in the sanctuary. We are not imagining or creating our own ideas here. We're trying to find out what God has already established to be true. Amen. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to the statement. Zechariah's vision of Joshua and the angel applies to peculiar force to the experience of God's people in the closing up of the great day of atonement. So what I have done, I gave you the sanctuary that I've been talking about. I gave you a copy of the study that I did in Zechariah that I'm talking about because I want you to go over it again and then you can come and tell me how wrong I am. I will love it. As long as you're studying the Bible, I'll be happy. The second thing was I gave you was the text of Zechariah chapter 6, 9 through 15 that we just went through. And on the back of the page, on the back page, I have a series of Ellen White quotes where she connects this idea of the closing up of the work to the judgment of the living. And so, this is some handouts, that the quotes I'm giving you. By the way, that I couldn't put them all on this page. I just gave you a, a, a handful. You can go and search this out yourself. All right? So, yes, the first quote I gave you, I put on the slide. The whole universe is looking with inexpressible interest to see the closing work of the great day of atonement. Yeah? Oh, I'm sorry. The great conversation of Christ himself. Christ is saying, at such a time as this, what time? Just as the great work of judging the living is to begin, shall we allow unsanctified ambition to take possession of our hearts? Mm. So she connects the closing work with the great work of judge, the judgment of the living. Do you see that? Yes. It could, okay. be, it could be going on right now. Then. Mm. Or, or that okay. Too quick. No, well, no, no, no. I need to talk about it. So no, we, we, can, we can talk more about it. God does nothing without revealing himself to his servant, the prophets. Yes? So when we start understanding it, then we can know that God is shining light. By the way, we don't come up with these ideas on our own, do we? I'm not standing up here because I'm smart or because I know something. No, no, I'm standing up here because... God made me stand up here and talk to I don't you know I have my brothers I'd be back there with Amber in the back seat quietly saying nothing and listening to somebody else. Yeah. If you told me well, when I was a kid I was going to be up front talking about people I'd say you lost your mind. God put me up here, yeah. right? And I'm praying that the words I'm saying are His, not my own. That's why I'm sticking close to the Bible. Yeah. So, so let's. This is a next. No, this is the fourth quote down on your paper. She says, solemn scenes, solemn are the scenes connected to the closing work of the atonement. Notice how she's very specific. The closing work of the atonement. Momentous are the interests involved therein. The judgment is now passing in the sanctuary above. The judgment of the dead. Right? Yes. For many years this work has been in progress, ever since 1844. Soon, no one knows how soon, it will pass to the cases of the living. living. The closing work again is connected to the judgment of the living. Yes, yes question. So there's going to be a split second. No more people are dead. And then he turns into the living. No. no. I wouldn't say that, but if that's the way you imagine it, that's too bad. Well, is that what she's saying? No. No, she's saying that there's an event in heaven that, that passes, the judgment passes from the dead to the living. 
and, 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 the, and the things that we think we can't figure out, I think God can figure it out. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the people asked Jesus once about uh, being the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And what did, what did Jesus say? God is not the God of the dead. He's the God of the, of the living. To God, to God what? The dead are living. All people are alive. Where is that from? That's, the, that's in the Bible. That's in Luke. Yeah, you can look that up. That's fine. So I guess in that sense, he's not talking about dead as of what we call dead. He's talking about those that are dead to the church. Yeah, yeah well, yeah. And that's, by the way, every truth has layers to it, yes. Because God has dead. By the way, in your point, by the way, sister, thank you. Isn't it wonderful that God is the one that judges me? Isn't it wonderful that God is the one? Someone said, well, what about those babies that are reported? How are we going to... Excuse me. Thank you. I'm not God. I don't have all the answers. But God is God and He knows. Amen. And He's going to save everyone He could possibly save. Amen. So, right? So, I don't... This is beautiful. I don't have to carry all those worries. Yeah. Yeah, no, no. I, I, I love this. I, I deal with God. He's God. I'll let him be God. And I'm a creature. I'll depend on him. He can take care of all that. He can make sure the stars go and the sun comes up and everything. And I'll just be a creature and try to handle with my own mess. And I can't do that until I give that to him too. Right? So some of these questions, by the way, are good questions. But the, the beauty of it is that God knows exactly what he's doing. Amen. It's also, you know, when you think about what you're saying, I mean, up until a point after 1844, the only cases that come under consideration are those who have died. Well, and those we, those who have died in Christ. In those Christ, in the faith. Christ. That's right. Amen. Thank so you're, you're, you're dealing with the judgment of the dead is the judgment of the righteous dead. Yes. Right. Not the judgment of the wicked dead. Yes. But there comes a point when cases of people who are still living, who are claiming to be righteous, come up before the throne. Mm-hmm. Even though they haven't physically died, yeah, yeah. that's the transition that she's talking. That's about. right. Yes. And so the judgment of the living judgment begins at the house of God, and then it's going to proceed outward. Yes. yes. So that everyone on this planet is going to make a decision for or against Christ. Yes. So that's the ju- that's why it's a process. Either the sheep yes. or the goats. Okay. So I want to I want to look at the next quote. Did I go so far? Let me see here. So I want to look at some of these other quotes. It says, I'm at the second quote right now. We read the first one and we read the fourth one. It says, As the books of record are open in the judgment, the lives of all who have believed on Jesus come and review before God. That's what we just said. Beginning with those who first lived upon the earth, our advocate presents each case of each successive generation and closes with the Living. 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 So again, the word closing of his work is connected to the living, living the judgment of the living. Isn't uh, just the fact where it says that the books of record open in judgment, the very fact that only the books are open of those that are righteous, that's already a first step of judgment. Yes, and that's the, that began in 1844. Daniel 7 verse 9, the court sat and the books were open. Well, I thought that was the dead. It is the dead. But here it says the lives. No, it starts with the... Yeah, the lives are in review, yes? Beginning with those who first lived upon the earth. That's Adam right. And so it dead. starts with... It starts with Adam and Eve and Abel and goes right down through. Yes, yeah. doesn't it? Yes? Does that make sense? And that began when? 1844. 1844. Daniel 7, 9. The courts are seated. The books are open. When, it, when we talk about it, it's just the judgment of the righteous, it's the judgment of those who profess the name of Christ. Claim to and then the it, it's That's determined right. whether they really were believers in Christ or not. So, let me finish this. Again, those who first lived on the earth, lived as in past tense, they're not living now. Our advocate presents each case of success, each successive generation, and it closes with the living. So again... She is consistent in what she's saying. The closing work is the judgment of the living. Now, the messages in Revelation, the re- messages in this chapter, Revelation 14, she says, constitute a threefold warning, which is to prepare the inhabitants of the earth of this earth for the Lord's second coming. The announcement, the hour of judgment has come, points to the closing work of his ministration. 
The salvation of men, it heralds the truth which must be proclaimed until the Savior's intercession shall cease and he shall return to the earth to take his people to himself. The work of judgment will begin in 1844, must continue until the cases of all are decided, both the living and the dead, hence it will extend to the close of the human probation. Right. So again, she describes the, the idea of the living connected to the, the judgment of the living is, is the closing work of his, of his ministration. Now, the last quote, the great plan of, the, plan of redemption as revealed in the closing work for these last days should receive close examination. examination. By the way, Mrs. White says that we should be studying the sanctuary, we should be studying the Day of Atonement. Why does she tell us that? Don't you already know that Jesus went from the Holy Place to the Most Holy Place in 1844? What are you going to study the 23rd days of the Day of Atonement for? Because you're involved. Going on. Because we don't understand it. If we understood the Day of Atonement, we would understand what she's saying. We think the Day of Atonement happened in 1844, and then we're just waiting for Jesus to come. No, that's not what's going on here. We're being inv we're involved in it. Well, there's, the Day of Atonement is a process. Uh, guess how many parts of the Day of Atonement? Seven. <laughs> ah, good guess. Now, how many of you go to Adventists can tell me the seven parts of the Day of Atonement? <clears throat> uh, what's, what are we going to next? See, we don't know what we're talking about. We say words, but we haven't studied out what the Bible says, what it means. And that, that's the problem. We think we know and we don't. And how can you tell the world about something you don't know? See, that's Welcome to the closing work. <laughs> now, I want this long as the last one's long, and I only got a few minutes left. He says the great plan of redemption, as revealed in the closing work for these last days, should receive close examination. That means you need to study your Bible. This seminar is not. I'm not doing it to give you all the answers. I'm giving you the ideas that I've seen from my study of Scripture. And I want you to go and study the Scripture. And please prove me wrong. Show me from the Bible what is the truth. So I can relish in it. As long as you're studying the Bible, I'm happy. Because if you're studying the Bible, God can direct your mind to what He wants you to know to be true. I don't want you to go on what I say. I want you to know what He says. Amen. That's why we're supposed to be doing a close examination, both studying our, our Bibles. So it says, The scenes connected with the sanctuary above should make such an impression upon the minds and hearts of all that they may be able to impress others. All need to become more intelligent in regard to the work of the atonement, which is going on in the sanctuary above. She tells us that we don't know, we don't understand, we need to become more intelligent about this. When this grand truth is seen and understood, those who hold it will work in harmony with Christ to prepare a people to stand in the great day of God. And their efforts will be successful by study. Study of what? The Bible. By study, contemplation, in other words, some of these things are not going to be simple and on the surface. Some You're going to have to stretch your thinking. And some of the things that you think you know, you're going to have to let go of. And some of the things that you don't even conceive in your mind, you're going to have to take hold of. By study, contemplation, and prayer, God's people will be elevated above the common earthly thoughts and feelings and will be brought into harmony with Christ and His great work of cleansing the sanctuary above from the sins of the people. Their faith will go to Him in the sanctuary and the worshipers on earth will carefully will carefully reviewing their lives and comparing their characters to the great standard of, of righteousness. They will see their own defects. They will also see that they must have the aid of the Spirit of God if they would become qualified for the great and solemn work for this time which is laid upon God's ambassadors. Amen. You hear that quote. Now let me ask you a question. Are dead people doing that? No. No, no who's she talking to? Living. Living people. She's describing what? The judgment of the living. When, you, when your name comes up in heaven and you're alive, 
Are you, aren't you supposed to be wrestling to make sure that God's, God's righteousness is your righteousness? Amen. That your sins are His and not yours anymore? Amen. Aren't you wrestling with the process of what God wants to do in you? Yes. And then when that happens, then God wants to do a work through you. That's part of the judgment of the living. And so I put this quote here because dead people can't do those things. Right. Only living people can do those things. And so, so what I'm showing you, and I, I, again, I apologize. I should be taking you to Zechariah and showing you the judgment of living in Zechariah, which I can and happily will do. Yes. Pastor, I, I have a quick question. Um, I know it's in my heart right now. And we're talking about close probation. And then um, you said something about when uh, the close probation, when Christ come, right? And then so I also have one thought that I heard this in many preachers, but correct me if I'm wrong. So we're talking about when probation flows, there are two kinds too, when, when we are dead, when people are dead, and that's done. It's all over. When probation closes, every case has been decided. That's right. Yes. So that's the close of probation. But see, the closing work and the close of probation... See, the close of probation the closing work are a process. We, we tend to talk about the close of probation, but we need to pay attention. The close of probation can describe the process of it just as much as it can describe the end of the process. Are you with me? So many times we mix up the phrase... And we think that, pro, we say the close of probation, and I'm always, always listening carefully. Are you saying the close of probation in terms of the process of the close of probation? Or are you talking about the close of probation in terms of probation as closed? Mm-hmm. See, there's a difference. Mm-hmm. And we have been confused. And we have attributed things to the close of probation that is not connected to the close of probation. You know, our, our, our founders, after the Great Disappointment in 1844, guess what they said of the other churches? Were they going to preach the gospel to the other churches when they, after, the, after 1844, the Great Disappointment? No. Were they going to build schools? No. And this is why it's actually telling people don't get married. Why? Because Jesus is coming. And probation had already closed for those people out there. That's what the Adventists believe. They believe that the, the probation had closed. Had probation closed? No. 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 Adventists have always had this jumping to the close of probation problem. We want to jump to the close of probation and say probation is closed to everybody else. Well, I'm sorry, you're not the king. You don't determine that. Amen. Praise God. Because if someone down in the jungles of the Amazon, the Amazon jungle down in South America has not heard the gospel, God isn't closing his probation until he's had life to make a decision. And it doesn't matter what you think, whether probation should be closed or not, because there's a Sunday law going on in America. Hey, you don't decide when probation is closed. You don't close people's probation. Jesus makes that decision. And Jesus is trying to save everybody. And we, by the way, should be trying to save everybody. Yes? Of course, we have to be saved ourselves first, don't we? Yes? Just a point of clarification that the Sunday law is not a signal of the close of probation. That's right. It's a signal that it's time for God's people to get out of the cities while they can get out. Yeah, actually, in my study, I think by the time of Sunday law... than that. But it's not... It's never been a signal of the close of probation. That's right. I think, if you want to ask me personally, by the time the Sunday law comes in full force, probation is already closed for most Adventists. Yes. Many people are waiting for a sign of the close of probation, and Satan has them deceived that the sign that they're waiting for is after it's already too late for them. Love of the world, the cares of this world. Because see, the problem is, see, the problem is, you're dealing with a process because God is trying to form a, a right character in His people, and it takes time to form a character. You don't just say, "Oh, I accept Jesus, so I'm saying no, no, no." It takes it takes time to form a character, and so God. These things are in a process. And so by the time you see the end of the process, you're supposed to already been through the process. Amen. You're God's messenger to tell the world what's going on when the, when the Sunday law happens. It's not time for you to figure out what the message is. Right. Right. No! You're supposed to go before the king and tell the world, prepare yourself for the coming of the king. And oh, well, the Sunday law comes, oh, I guess I better get ready. <laughs> what? Yeah. What are you well, doing? And that's by the way, that's what Satan, this, this is the way he talked about, Satan deceiving us to take it easy and run. Oh, you have time, don't worry about it. 
So you, you just, just, just wait till you wake up and, and look at the paper when it says National Sunday Law. Then grab your Bible and start, start, start trying to figure it out. What? No. See, that, see, that's part of the problem I think that's happening is that we think we're sitting around waiting for Jesus to come. No, that's not what we're doing. That's not what we're supposed to be doing. Jesus' is coming is at the end of the process, but the process, we're supposed to be engaging in the process now so that He can not only save us, but use us to save other people. Amen. Yeah. We're supposed to reflect the character of the King. We're supposed to be becoming as well. Now, I want you to pay attention to the time because the meeting at 11 is going to happen, and I don't want you to think that I... That I, that I kept you here as a captive. Anybody that needs to leave, please, please go. The, the, the meeting's at 11. But I, you know, I could be here all day, 24 hours a day, continue talking, and I'd be just as excited to keep talking about it because I love to talk about the king. So let's, yeah, let's have prayer. And then those that need to leave can leave, and those that would like to stay, ask questions or whatever for clarification, we can, you can, we can do so. So Heavenly Father, thank you for this time and space. Father, we see what's going on in the world, and the world is falling apart. But we don't want to see the world. We want to see Jesus. So I ask that you would send your Holy Spirit to take that which is His and make it known unto us. Father, we want to understand. We want to, to be intelligent, cooperative agents with you in the process of your cleansing work so that not only can we reflect your character, but we can be mouthpieces that we can be living witnesses to the world, that they too can be transformed by the love of God. Just bless us. Uh, bless this camp meeting and continue to be this week as we study um, with these themes in mind. In Jesus' name.